Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of you joining us from the United States, Professor Greer and others. Uh, welcome to this seminar about, uh, about the EU crisis and in particular the EU's response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or Corona crisis, um, which it is sometimes called. My name is uh, Marianne Riedervall. Uh, I am a research professor here at uh, NUPI and a professor in political science at uh, Inland uh, University. Uh, and this uh, seminar is uh, <clears throat> part of the Norway Meets Europe series, which is uh, financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it is also linked to, to NUPIS uh, <clears throat> Center for European Studies or European Studies Center, uh, which is coordinated by Pernille Riki. And uh, uh, unfortunately, Panilla couldn't be here today, so I will host instead uh, of her. So that means that um, what we will do is that I will first present uh, uh, um, our guest speaker, Professor Scott Greer. I will then talk for uh, 10 to 15 minutes about uh, our handbook on EU crisis, uh, which we newly published with uh, Palgrave. Uh, and also uh, Scott Greer has contributed a, a chapter. Yes, thanks, there it is. Um, and uh, then I will give the floor to Scott who will talk for approximately 30 minutes and then we'll move on to discussions and Q&A. And the Q&A uh, uh, function is open uh, in the chat. So please start uh, posing interesting questions to us. Uh, I will collect them and forward them to Scott uh, during our discussions. So it's uh, really it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Professor Scott Greer to NUPI to talk about the EU's response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Greer is a political scientist. He is Professor of Health Management and Policy, Professor of Global Public Health and Professor uh, of Political Science at the University of Michigan. And he is also a senior expert, expert advisor on health governance for the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And I don't think there are many people uh, who know today's topic better than Scott. He has uh, published extensively on EU health policies uh, and politics uh, in books and journals. Uh, including, just to mention a few, The Lancet, uh, the Journal of European Public Policy, uh, the British Medical Journal, and um, a selection of his many books uh, uh, includes everything you always wanted to know about European health policies but were afraid to ask from 2014, and I strongly recommend that. Um, a second edition from 2000, no, a third edition actually forthcoming now, um, shortly. And oh, he has also written a book on European Union public health policies and also studied European Union after Brexit uh, and um, health policies and populism. And he has, even if we were only a bit more than a year into this uh, pandemic, uh, Professor Greer has actually also published uh, extensively already on the coronavirus, uh, on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its implications for Europe. Um, and he did one chapter in the handbook that I will briefly present. And he has also recently co-edited the book that's standing right behind him in his bookshelf, uh, which is called uh, uh, The Coronavir uh, Coronavirus Politics, the Comparative Politics and Policies of COVID-19. And that is an open access book, so there's a link on the web page for this seminar where you can find the link to the book. Um, but uh, before letting uh, uh, Scott speak, I will give um, the floor then to myself uh, and uh, briefly discuss, present. Uh, so it should be okay now. So I will then, this is the topic for today. Uh, we are discussing uh, EU crisis, uh, EU integration in the face of crisis, and in particularly looking at how uh, the EU has responded and integrated in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, 
Uh, you will also find a link to this uh, book also on our webpage, but it's unfortunately it's not an open access book, at least not yet, but you can always contact me if you're interested in certain parts of the book um, and I will uh, help you access. Uh, so what we do in this uh, book, um, uh, the handbook, it's a huge book. It's almost we have uh, we're very proud to have um, uh, been able to get chapters and contributions from very many of the most well-renowned EU scholars. Uh, and what we do um, uh, in this book is to ask the kind of rather big question of how uh, crisis affects EU integration. And the main argument that we make uh, after having uh, studied uh, uh, quite a few of them is that the EU actually grows or tends to uh, integrate further in response to crisis. Uh, 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 so either through kind of muddling through or do, doing all these kind of incremental steps towards more cooperation and also more integration, or taking uh, bigger steps by uh, developing new policy uh, agreements and policy areas. Um, and uh, uh, in a sense, uh, this is also um, uh, uh, what the EU has always been about. Uh, on the basis of our book, we then also argue uh, when it was published that we expected the EU to continue to integrate further in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is also what Greer uh, uh, argues in the book and is has studied extensively also since and we'll uh, discuss uh, when I'm done talking in a few minutes. But in a sense, this is what the, uh, the EU uh, always has done. Um, uh, the EU is, uh, in a sense, the result of compromises between integration in response to common challenges on the one hand and member states trying to keep their sovereignty or control in uh, various uh, policy areas. And that, of course, differs from member state to member state, but that is why the EU today is such uh, a complex entity that is uh, uh, where the member states have uh, given up sovereignty or shared sovereignty in almost all policy areas, but less so in policy areas that are closest to the member state sovereignty so, or state sovereignty. So migration, health, defense are the typical areas where there traditionally uh, have been less uh, integration, but this is uh, changing. Uh, and um, so, uh, and what is unique with the EU is that the EU, compared to all other international organizations, have has developed uh, or taken this cooperation to a supranational level. So we have an independent policy making system, independent institutions, and EU law is superior to to national law. And this step, this process has been stepwise uh, uh, and. Uh, encompassing more and more policy areas. And in particular, uh, these steps have uh, been taken following crisis, uh, which is also then the, the, what uh, Jean Monnet also said in his memoirs in uh, 1976, that the EU will kind of uh, be forged uh, through its responses to crisis. So why then do we do this book now? Why, um, why a handbook on EU crisis in coming out in 2021? Um, um, it was uh, it, it was a, by chance uh, coming out uh, in the midst of the pandemic. But uh, why now? Why study? When we started this project in 2018, why started? Why start developing a big project on uh, discussing how EU uh, or crisis affect EU integration? So what we argue in this book um, is that even if the EU has been hit by crisis before, uh, the the last two decades, as you know, have been uh, unique in a sense because the EU has been hit by so many different crises in parallel in so many different policy areas. And uh, Anderson, Jeff Anderson discusses that explicitly in one of the chapters uh, in the book. So what we want to do is that we kind of wanted to, and we have 
heard many times that the EU is breaking down in the face of crisis and we wanted to kind of take a bird's eye look at the EU and to see if the EU actually is breaking down in the face of uh, crisis and how more systematically or understand more systematically how crisis affects uh, um, e-integration. So what we then do in this book is that we kind of uh, do a much more systematic study of crisis uh, impact on um, EU integration. And we discuss all the main crises that the EU has been facing in recent years. So that includes Brexit, Brexit the democracy or legitimacy crisis, in particular in Hungary and Poland, um, Russian aggression in uh, uh, in Ukraine and uh, and uh, beyond the migration crisis, the financial crisis, uh, which is also, of course, the the new financial crisis with uh, the pandemic. And also we were lucky to get Scott to, to write about the pandemic. And we look at this across EU institutions, how uh, the EU institutions are able to deal with crisis. And we also look at the typical EU integration theory's ability to deal with crisis and understand the impact of crisis uh, on the EU. And we were also interested in seeing what this, our findings, our comparative findings, tells about the EU more generally or broadly. So for in um, to be able to do this more uh, systematically, and I will not go through this in detail, but we what we do in the book is also that we develop kind of three different scenarios or ideal typical scenarios of how the EU might respond to crisis. And drawing on different integration theories, and this will then happen through different mechanisms, and Scott will come back to, to one of them, uh, is uh, <clears throat> that is first of all, the EU might of course break down in the face of crisis. This is a claim we have heard for decades actually, but uh, to a large extent also uh, during the, the latest uh, year's crisis. And we saw that initially also with the COVID-19 <clears throat> uh, crisis that the EU was uh, struggling to deal with it. And, uh, and we had newspapers and others, uh, observers discussing that the EU was not coping and it was gonna break down in the face of this crisis, just as we heard uh, with the financial crisis and other, other crisis, the migration crisis, other issues that the EU has been facing. Um, but uh, we also develop uh, two alternative uh, models of how the EU might respond. And one is that the EU will kind of model through, through various mechanisms. It will kind of be able to uh, get through crisis through its typical or uh, institutional ways of doing things uh, through uh, amongst others, uh, what um, Scott and others refer to as uh, failing forward um, is by integrating further, but not perhaps sufficiently in order to deal with the common challenges. And the last um, step uh, or scenario uh, uh, or way that the EU might deal with crisis is to head forward, to take big integrative steps towards more integration in certain areas. Uh, and we find, uh, to sum up our findings very, very uh, briefly, we see that uh, on our, uh, overall, when we compare, we have uh, several chapters on all of the different main crises that the EU has been facing since the financial crisis. And what we see is uh, that the EU is mainly muddling through or heading forward with more integration in the face of all of these crises. So even if the EU in some cases in the short term uh, is struggling to cope, in pure functional terms, the EU tends to move forward uh, incrementally or take big steps forward when facing crisis. That is when we take the longer uh, term perspective and look at the EU's responses. So uh, I, you will have to look read the book to see the details on the different crises. Uh, but um, the only uh, crisis where we conclude that the EU is, or at least at the uh, 
time of finishing the book was kind of uh, breaking down in the face of crisis was the legitimacy crisis in Eastern Europe because we argued that the EU has not been able to, or at least at the time, uh, not been able to take big steps uh, in seeking to deal with this uh, through more integration. But we see now recently uh, that the EU is also taking bigger steps in this uh, uh, when it comes to dealing with the legitimacy or democracy challenges in in some of the member states, uh, amongst other things, through the rescue package that the EU member states have agreed to uh, in uh, dealing also with the financial aspects of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So what does then uh, I will finish and uh, uh, let uh, Scott uh, talk more about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the response. But what we argue then more uh, broadly is that this our findings uh, tell us uh, one that crisis um, is a key driver of e integration and uh, that in functional terms, this is how the EU tends to deal with crisis and respond to crisis. It tends to move forward with more cooperation in order to deal with common challenges. And that also suggests that the EU is consolidated enough as a polity, as, a, uh, as an organization, uh, to withstand and deal with crisis. We argue that the crisis no longer threatens the European Union as a polity. The challenge then, of course, is that the EU is, we, as we, I uh, said, is even if the EU is able to deal functionally with crisis by integrating further, coming up with new policies, common policies uh, in, in order to deal with common challenges, the challenge is to find a balance where the EU is dealing efficiently with crisis in terms of output, being able to produce policies uh, that can uh, can deal with the common challenges. And also, for example, we have seen with COVID-19 that uh, the population, EU populations uh, actually want uh, or expect the EU to take on more responsibility on the one hand and do that in a legitimate and uh, democratic way uh, on the other hand. That is, uh, finding this balance, um, we argue, would be will be one of the main challenges facing the EU uh, in the future and in the coming year. And this is challenging, for example, when it comes to Hungary and Poland, not only from this more democratic or value-based perspective, but also because it kind of threatens one of the core ideas of the EU project, which is uh, the idea that this, after all, this uh, cooperation is voluntary. So uh, uh, EU rules are binding, but member states also have to implement and follow them. And if it is up to the member states to decide what, uh, which rules uh, they want to follow and which ones they do not want to follow, for example, when in as we have seen with some of the demo uh, democracy challenges in Poland and Hungary, that will challenge the EU also functionally. Uh, so, um, uh, on that uh, note, I uh, want to um, uh, give the hand the floor over to, uh, to Scott, who will go into much more detail on the EU's response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And he will also, uh, he, yeah, he will also, yeah, he will also uh, talk a bit about this comparatively, I think. And please remember to uh, post your question in in the in the chat, and I will post them to Scott later. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. And I want to say I think I can talk a little bit more quickly because. Having looked at this book, we agree on a lot, and it's partly because it's very persuasive. It's a really impressive, synthetic effort, and I recommend it. So I am attempting to screen share. I live in a world of Zoom and WebEx, so this is very exciting to me. Okay, so can I have a thumbs up for Mariana if this is working correctly? Perfect. So I want to thank you and I got embarrassed, of course, by the introduction. 
because one of the first rules is that scholarship, particularly high speed social science, takes a team. And I wanted to highlight four of my collaborators from four different countries who have worked with me on this. And I often feel like an imposter because they know so much more and they articulate it so much better than I do. So if much of this seminar is being spent telling you to read things, I realize, but I strongly recommend reading the work of these four people. Anik de Reuter, Sarah Rosenblum, Holly Jarman, and Eleanor Brooks. And this is also based on a lot of published research. I'm guessing these slides will be available somewhere. This is not so much to boast. It's just to assure you that we have actually done our homework. That This is based on a lot of research into policy, original reviewing documents, looking at it comparatively and so forth. And especially if you're interested in what countries have done, I recommend having a look at the website on the lower left, which is the European Observatory, which is a WHO agency, has teams of people in every country working on how health systems are responding from governance to telehealth to contact tracing, all the interesting questions. So I think you might have seen something like this slide within the last few minutes. I put it in because I thought it was a very impressive synthetic effort to deal with all these different conflicting theories. And the book sets some theoretical expectations, and it's a great hypothesis test to have theoretical expectations right as you go into a gigantic crisis. So obviously, in most respects, a terrible global pandemic is unlucky, but it is useful for certain scientific purposes. And the one I want to highlight is muddling through, which isn't as glorious as heading forward and isn't as exciting to journalists, especially British journalists, as breaking down but nonetheless is this tendency and i want to highlight in that description taken from the introduction to the book the extent to which the eu muddles through crisis through path dependent incremental responses because a lot of the problem when you're working in mid-crisis is just how big an issue is this just how big is the crisis just how big is the response and one of the things you can grab to try and start to understand is, well, is it path dependent? Even if it's a big increment, is it an increment? In other words, for example, you would predict that if they put a lot more money into existing budget lines, that would be a path dependent incremental response. If they do something radically new, like a new agency, that might push us toward it being big. Of course, the gold standard for a big change would be a treaty change. <coughs> and the threshold for a treaty change at the moment is very high because do you want to negotiate with some of these governments? So focusing in on failing forward, um, well, you've once again seen one of these quotes, but I almost deleted the slide and I just can't get rid of that lovely Time magazine cover of Jean Monnet, who really did know how to look like a simple French cognac producer, which is what he was in his spare time. And I want to highlight again, the thing about the failing forward line, which is defined in the quote from Jones, Kellerman and Minier in 2015, they were writing about finance. And the defining thing about failing forward is the EU moves forward, but it's incomplete. And it's incomplete because it's the lowest common denominator solution of countries that don't agree. If you think about the financial crisis, you are going to get a lowest common denominator solution in any negotiation involving Germany, France and Spain at the same time. They have very different interests. So it's incomplete relative to the scale of the crisis. The problem is, again, methodologically, this means that we have the question of, well, how big is the crisis? Because an incomplete solution to a small crisis will be much smaller than an incomplete solution to a gigantic crisis in many cases. So one of the things to keep an eye on as we try to understand what's happened with COVID-19 is the extent to which we can tell if the solution is incomplete, because you can be very, very big and dramatic and not adequate to the standards of the time. And if you want an example of very big, dramatic and inadequate activity, I would point you to, for example, most of the public health policy in France and the United Kingdom over the last 14 months. Very big, very dramatic, not very impressive. So moving into health, which is my happy place, and I've spent enough time in Brussels that I really feel like I'm not doing my job if I don't give you a treaty base. And once upon a time, I studied a little short treaty base that would fit on a slide, but now I have to take excerpts and even still boldface 
And what I've boldfaced is a sample of the dominant linguistic register of Article 168, which is the only thing in the public health title. Look at this language, shall complement national policies, shall encourage cooperation, if necessary, lend support, encourage cooperation, improve complementarity. This article is a dictionary of all the words that you can use in European Union law if you want to make sure that the European Union does not do anything independent of the member states. And at the end, it clinches with the point that I entirely bold faced, which is an explicit statement that the union action shall respect the responsibilities of member states for the definition of health policy and the organization and delivery of health services and medical care. They did not want a European Union health policy, except under very tight constraints that they controlled, such as Europe against cancer or work against um, illegal drug abuse or work on very specific things like certain elements of HIV AIDS policy. And they wrote a treaty article to put the commission in jail. With the result that the European Union's health policy has three faces. And the first one is that sad little treaty base. Article 168 plus Article 9 says that the EU shall take trade and health into account in everything that it does. That, as you might imagine, that's a difficult article to implement. And it hasn't achieved a lot up to the beginning of 2020 when we did the second edition of our Everything You Need to Know About European Union Health Policy book. We had one dossier to talk about, which was a regu proposed regulation on health technology assessment. And if you've never heard of health technology assessment, that's OK. It's not a big policy area. And we were emphasizing all the other places in the treaty instead where there's more powerful treaty bases that mention health, such as social policy or consumer protection, which in theory is a very powerful legal base, even if most of the time nothing happens on it. So that's the first face. It's nice. It says health is a goal. It has paid for some research projects. It has paid for an agency in Stockholm with 300 people. I can't believe that just happened. I thought it was on silent. Sorry about that. <laughs> Instead, European Union health policy came through two other faces. And the biggest one, as you would predict from the nature of the EU, is the second face. It's smart market making policies that affect health because there's a reason it was called the European Economic Community for a long time. It's under internal market treaty basis that they regulate pharmaceuticals. State aids law is built out of cases about things like airlines. Competition law is built out of cases on things like local monopolies on public services. Patient mobility law is based on non-discrimination between different providers. Over and over again, what you find is that healthcare systems have been influenced by policies grounded in internal market laws. So even if you go read, for example, the general food law regulation, which is in my head, a public health law to preserve food safety, what you find is a whole list of agricultural treaty bases because agricultural treaty bases are strong. You find a whole list of internal market treaty bases because they're strong. And you find one highly qualified reference that was clearly written to tell courts that nothing depends on Article 168 because Article 168 just isn't good enough. Then you have the third phase, which is fiscal policies, and these come and go. We have a crisis. People who support austerity impose a big elaborate structure of fiscal policies. Uh, over time, they're worn down by everybody who doesn't support a particular concept of Northern European austerity. They collapse, then we have another crisis and they're reinvented. And the semester was the most recent arc of incredibly grand plans to have the EU evaluating French medical education for its contribution to stability and growth pact. And by the time it was abandoned in early 2020, it primarily contained recommendations to improve health care, such as telling Italians to reduce north south disparities. In other words, it turns out a lot of people don't want austerity, even if you write it into a treaty. But it still makes big grand claims, right? You saw what I said in Article 60, 168 that you're not supposed to have the European Union telling member states how to organize their health care systems. Meanwhile, under a different element of EU fiscal governance, they're telling the French in detail that they shouldn't have a numerous clausus on medical education, right? 
This is to make the head hurt. That's enough text. At the observatory, we commissioned a cartoon in late 2019 to explain what was going on. There's the gate. It's a beautiful gate in a field. It's solid, it's well oiled, it's sturdy. It'll keep an animal in. And there's no fence. Article 168 is a beautifully built gate. You can make health policy. You can open the gate if you want to. It will open. It is well oiled. It is smooth. But meanwhile, all these different other policy areas are simply going around the gate because they never built a fence. And we just listed a few of them. Agriculture, the semester, internal market, competition, international trade law. Civil protection largely grew out of international development aid for the EU. So that's our 2019 cartoon. We had to commission a new cartoon in mid 2020 because the scale of the expenditures and the scale of the responsibilities being given to Article 168 first face European health policy just blew us away. And I said it was a sturdy gate, but there's no way you can restrain the European Council in a full panic, which is what happened. So let's talk about it. Go back about a year and you had a terrible spectacle in Europe. It did look like the falling apart scenario. You had enormous national egotism. Within countries, you had enormous regional egotism. Nobody was sharing any prote personal protective equipment, PPE with Italy, but frankly, within Italy, nobody was sharing any PPE with Veneto and Lombardy. If you were in Sicily and you had a stockpile, you held onto it because you expected that the wave was coming for you. And if you were in Austria and you had a stockpile, you held on to it because you thought the wave was coming for you. So even on the most basic level, there's a thing called rescue, which is a civil protection stockpile. And its basic concept is that if Sweden has wildfires and Spain doesn't, then Spain can loan firefighting equipment to Sweden. And it has small stockpiles jointly financed with the member states. It would have been useful. Did they activate it in March? No. In April? No, they didn't activate it until May. And instead they got into, remember that horrible period when everyone's trying to buy things from everybody and the Chinese are sending masks to the Italians before the Germans send any masks to the Italians, which was great for European solidarity. Then it turned out the Chinese masks weren't any good. Then the Czechs impounded masks that were being re-exported and nobody could tell if it was a corruption thing or the Czechs were just stealing Italy's masks. A lot of these turned out to be wrong, but the look was really bad. And meanwhile, you had all sorts of border controls, mobility controls. It felt like the falling apart scenario and a bunch of journalists got good headlines out of saying it was. Turns out it's hard to fall apart. This is just a few reasons why that rapidly ended. One is national egotism. The only factory in Europe that produced medical grade PPE and masks was in Northern Italy. If you punish Italy, you're not going to have any masks pretty quickly. Would product availability be limited by who happened to have what factory? Look at the vaccines. Look at the debate we're having right now, for example, about vaccine production. It turns out that raw materials for vaccines made in Belgium come from the UK. That's one reason that this is not a good time to have a Brexit breakdown. The country I use to examine this, both in medical equipment and in general, is Belgium. There's almost nothing except beer that is made in Belgium all the way. But on the other hand, it's very hard to buy things in Europe that don't have some component of Belgian production. So if you leave Belgium on its own, Belgium has practically nothing it actually produces from beginning to end. But the rest of the continent turns out not to have a lot of things either that don't have a Belgian component. So if you start to impose national borders on freight and personal mobility, you rapidly break up a very integrated economy and you start to see shortages. Furthermore, a lot of Southern Europe depends on tourism. That's a powerful force. And a lot of Northern Europe depends on getting some sun in January. And that's also a powerful force. Just try to get between the Germans and Mallorca. So then you have workforce mobility. It's easy to overstate it, especially if you're an academic because we're all running around all the time. But there's some important sectors that depend on labor mobility. Agriculture depends substantially on Central and Eastern European harvesters who have a, are in motion constantly across the continent. 
Healthcare depends substantially, especially the lower paid segments on people from Central and Eastern Europe and beyond. And there's also lots of specialist workforce, things like truckers who cross borders. The result is the member states rapidly realized they could not self-isolate. They could no more do that than their people could go in and never come out of their houses. Which brings us to May. That's the most inspiring photograph I could find. I'm sorry if it doesn't live up to the to the challenge. When once again, the problems of shutting down an integrated economy led to a European rescue of the nation state with apologies to Millward. And this is where that elephant smashed through the gate. This is just a little list of a few of the things they've done with substantial money. And I'm being a little bit coy about giving actual euro signs because most of these numbers aren't quite complete, but they're really big as in orders of magnitude larger. EU for Health picks up the health program, which was ending and gave it far more money, about 10 times more. The vaccine strategy, which I'll come back to, is joint is collective procurement in which the EU institutions negotiate the purchase of vaccines for the member states. Not a joint procurement buyers club, which is what they had before. There's a pharmaceutical strategy to improve the long term pipeline because we've all discovered how dependent we are on production in India. Agencies expansion of the European Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and now they're developing a new agency, which is a global anti pandemic agency. And finally, the, the less expected one is a massive expansion of rescue, which has been changed so that one member state can team up with rescue. You don't need a coalition of member states. You just need one of them that decides that the EU needs a stockpile of something and rescue can get to work. And that's budget increased about 20 times. This is a substantial amount of money. It's a substantial amount of new jobs and expertise and advocacy within European politics and the member states. So uh, if you study public health, this is a very attractive labor market for you. Meanwhile, on the second and third phases, on the second phase, it turned out that the threats to the internal market could be turned back. The Commission acted quickly against the export bans. It threatened infringement proceedings. I think it was kicking in an open door. It was kicking in an open door because of the logic I just gave you. If you close your borders and don't export useful things to Italy and Italy does the same to you, you're not going to have any face masks and you're going to be worse off than Italy is a blunt way to put it. So the commission comes along and says stop doing that. A lot of member states were already learning that they had to stop doing that. There's also something that is interesting if it sticks, which is that in trade law, which was imported directly into the first European Economic Community Treaties, public health is an exception. This is actually what Cassis de Dijon is about. Public health is an exception that allows a member state to not carry out its agreements to free trade. So Cassis de Dijon was a, to my mind, insane German argument that there was a public health reason why you couldn't drink the French liquor because it had a alcohol content that would confuse Germans and lead to drunkenness. In other words, the Germans said, there's a public health argument for restricting Cassis de Dijon. And the courts don't look on this favorably. That's really not how the European legal system thinks. In the middle of the crisis, the commission issued an opinion saying public health must be viewed from a European perspective. So in other words, if you want to refuse to give personal protective equipment to Italy, you have to explain how that benefits Europe. Good luck. They also backed off stringent regulation, for example, a reform of the medical devices regulation. Things that would have caused disruption, putting aside the policy merits. Now, in the third phase, I'm not going to talk about this much because I'm not a finance person, but they immediately invoked the general escape clause. The semester basically stopped. They replaced it with what we debate is the Hamiltonian moment because the EU compared to Federation stands out very strongly precisely for the absence of real money, right? So the EU is 1% of the GDP of the European Union as a whole. Well, your average health system in the EU is between 6 and 12%. So the whole EU budget is one sixth of the GDP of the cheapest health system in Europe. Yes, it's a lot compared to the economy of Hungary, but no, it's not a lot compared to what it takes to run healthcare. So this anomaly, that the EU is this enormous legal system with basically no money and no internal redistribution 
is partially addressed by the breakthrough of EU issued debt, issued debt to support the member states without conditionality. And that's tied to the Recovery and Resilience Fund process, which replaces the semester effectively. And that's a lot of money. And even if the money doesn't impress you or the fact that it's time limited doesn't impress you, notice that this crosses a Rubicon. This is the European Union issuing debt to finance member states in trouble with no conditionality, no troika, no semester telling the French that they don't understand medical and school admissions. It's money. And that's what every other federation that survives does. So watch that space. This is all very pro-European, I guess, or at least impressed with what's happened. So let's go to vaccines, which is less popular. It's useful to distinguish between vaccines and vaccination. Vaccines means acquiring the little bottles in cold storage. Vaccination means getting them into arms. And these are two different problems. And we're switching from having a vaccines problem in rich countries to having a vaccination problem. So the vaccine strategy was a big bet on solidarity. Originally, a small number of self-confident rich countries with pharmaceutical industries, the Ger basically the Germans, the Dutch, uh, French and the Italians were going to go purchase together. They realized two things. One is that purchasing for 446 million people gets you much better attention from pharmaceutical companies than purchasing for a couple of medium sized countries. Secondly, they realized that the solidarity characteristics of this could be fatal. If the Germans, the Italians, the Dutch and the French were all vaccinated and the Belgians, the Portuguese and the Polish were not, it would be terrible politics. And remember what I said about mobility within Europe. You're not going to achieve herd immunity if all your agricultural laborers from Poland are unvaccinated because you were too selfish. So they bet on solidarity. Member states could always buy outside the system, and some of them are doing so now. They can also buy from each other. OK, so there's no there's no prison. Germany is not forbidden to buy vaccines from somebody else. Germany chose not to. Now, at this point, they gave negotiation to the European Commission. This probably in retrospect was a mistake. They should have just bought a commercial law firm services because the contracts were not especially well drafted as AstraZeneca keeps telling us. And they got their priorities a bit wrong. They focused on price and liability. Price is a problem because the cost of vaccines, even at 10 times the price, is nothing compared to the cost of lockdowns. If you lose another summer in Europe, you, you could spend far more on vaccines and still make money. That summer is really expensive. And they focused on liability because a number of key policymakers basically are very attentive to people who don't trust the pharmaceutical industry, who are hesitant about vaccines, and who thought that it would give fuel to vaccine resistance and hesitancy if people realized that the companies had not been um, left with legal liability. The British, the Americans, we just said no legal liability for the companies. If it goes wrong, the government will indemnify. <clears throat> and of course, once things start to go wrong, you blame the European Union because that's one of its key functions, right? Blaming Europe is a absolutely basic part of the toolkit of every member state government. But I want to say the European Union was not blameless, right? That was a poorly drafted contract because EU public law specialists shouldn't be writing commercial contracts with pharmaceutical companies. And they made this political decision that they would focus on price and liability when they should have focused on getting shots into those on pallets, onto airplanes, into countries as fast as they could. Then there's vaccination. At this point, the formal structure is that actually once the EU has done the negotiation, Italy writes the check to Pfizer and Pfizer delivers the pallets to Italy. So once the vaccines show up, the European Union role is essentially gone. I just want to highlight this partly because a lot of member states are going to blame the EU for things that go wrong in vaccination and they'll they'll be lying. But there's huge problems and huge diversity, right? So there's serious risks in Central and Eastern Europe. They have the highest vaccine hesitancy in the world. So Serbia, which isn't exactly comparable to other CEE countries, but still, on one hand, they're an absolutely fantastic vaccine acquirer. They have lots of vaccines and they almost immediately hit such a level of resistance to vaccination that they're now exporting them all over the Balkans. 
France, very high vaccine hesitancy, very well organized. And of course, Italy is, a sh is shameful. And this is what might happen in a number of other countries. The least vaccinated group in Italy is the 85 plus. And meanwhile, the number of putative healthcare workers in some of southern Italy's regions has exploded, meaning that organized crime has started to divert the vaccines into their people instead of, for example, the vulnerable elderly. So on vaccines, the European Union deserves some blame, but it's getting more of it than it should. On vaccination, the European Union will get blame, but the coming public health problem is going to be very national and very diverse. Before I end, I want to tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to evaluate the European Union as a public health power. That's really hard. It's hard to evaluate any country's policies. So unless you're talking about Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, the ones that have effectively suppressed and almost eliminated COVID, it's hard to say, for example, that excess mortality is attributable to policy. Italy is an old country. This virus really goes after people above 65. Europe is more or less condemned to have worse mortality among infected people because Europe has many more older people. It's very hard to find the mortality from COVID-19 in some African countries when the average age is below 16. And we don't really understand everything. I love public policy. I love to attribute things to policy. But when you look at age structure, economic structure, household structure, India is getting hit hard because they have multi-generational families in small houses. Even distribution of cell level immunity things that are completely outside political science. These all vary and they all have an explanatory power. So journalists always want us to say that Czechia is stupider than Poland or France is smarter than Spain. Don't let them. Instead, remember Tolstoy. The opening lines of Anna Karenin are all happy families are alike, but every ha unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. To get COVID-19 right, you had to do everything right. And there's about a half dozen countries, mostly in the Pacific, that did it. Everybody else is different and they're different and interesting and sad in their own way. <clears throat> so to conclude, from an integration perspective, I'm not talking about mortality in cases, but I'm talking about integration. The EU has had a good pandemic. It's expansion of the European Union role at the behest of the member states, and it's defined by expansion of the first face relative to other faces, meaning there's a large new European Union health policy, both relative to other European Union policies that affect health and frequently don't do it for the better, and defined by relationship to the actual health enterprise on the continent. That said, everybody right now is mad about vaccines and blaming the European Commission. Well, the risk is not that they're going to go backwards. The risk is that this gets remembered by member states and the public as the European Union was given an important task and failed. So the risk is to public trust because EU for Health, the health program, will need to have its funding renewed. The new agencies will have to have their funding renewed, their budgets decided. They're going to have to decide if the pharmaceutical strategy, which would be kind of a permanent vaccine strategy, will actually continue, et cetera, et cetera. And if they conclude that this was all kind of a big mistake, then we can go back to where we were, which is a very small health program doing a few things about, you know, whether or not drinking tea is good for heart health. I also, this is another point where we agree, it is no accident that it is during a pandemic that democratic backsliding has become so obvious that we can't really say Hungary is a democracy in any sense. So the excuse of the pandemic, in most countries you don't see big political change due to the pandemic, but using the pandemic as an excuse, we've seen really alarming authoritarianism and rejection of the rule of law. So I'm with Dan Kellerman, but that's the existential threat to the EU. And in terms of coding it, finally, I said, began with the methods point. We're right on the edge between muddling through and heading forward. And I think it's because they've used existing path dependent policy structures. They know how to run a health program. They just renamed it EU for Health and put far more money into it. If that sticks, if we continue to have a large EU health budget through those mechanisms, then maybe we're not just muddling through, we're heading forward.
And I would be very surprised if there were a treaty change, but there's more interest and excitement surrounding it than I would have imagined after the experiences of treaty change proposals of history. So thank you very much. I'd love to take questions. Um, and if you want a free copy of the coronavirus politics ebook, the, that's the shortened link at the bottom of the slide. And I will then, as a member of Zoom land, try to figure out how to stop screen sharing. OK, thank you very much for a very interesting and fascinating talk. Uh, we have opened up for uh, uh, questions and please just keep uh, posing questions in the chat. Uh, we have some uh, questions who have come in already. So um, some of them are linked to kind of the more long term consequences of this, which is, of course, always difficult to predict. Um, but uh, um, you said that you don't expect treaty change, but at the same time you say that you see kind of the EU has already had a good crisis and the EU is muddling through and it's heading forward. So even if you have to kind of uh, predict a bit, where do you where do you see the EU going? What is your kind of main expectations. Do you see that the, the EU having a much bigger health policy in a few years based on what you know now? Or do you think that this will kind of uh, go back again? Or do you? Oh, you're muted. I think it will stick. I think you're, I would be surprised if in a year there's going to be anywhere near as much desire for treaty change, for example, as you're seeing now, because a thing to keep in mind is people want to forget this. You know, the, the pressure on us to forget every government that screwed up will want us to forget every political party that has nothing to say about health, mostly the populist radical right will want us to forget everybody who owns a bar or a restaurant or an airline or a gymnasium will want us to forget. And personally, many of us will want to forget. So what that means is that I think the pressure for the sense of political crisis is in most countries is going to dissipate quickly. And once the vaccines have been administered, which I would say is going to happen this year, I think a lot of people are, even if people like me are still saying that the world has a vaccine equity problem, then that's a nice global health problem and you can think about it if you want to. So my hunch is that we're going to continue to see high levels of investment in existing things. We're not going to see treaty change. I book that as a very advanced form of muddling through. They're using the same path dependent incremental tools, but they're big increments. We know what a European agency is. We know what a European research budget is. We know what the health program is. They're just far larger now. OK. Uh, and also then in uh, uh, if we kind of if you look back, then if you go five years, if you go to 2030 and we look back, do you think that the EU people will still think that the EU had a good crisis? I think EU health people are likely to think it. Hmm. The real question, and I get very nervous from some very informed questions appearing in the Q&A, mm. whether the fiscal policy changes, right? Whether this is a Rubicon crossed. Because if in 2030 we have a real EU budget that is actually stabilizing, is actually controlling or reducing the disparities between member states, that will be epical. That will be much bigger than changes in the scale of European health policy. Yeah, because we had that. That was where I was uh, where I was going with this kind of. Do you see that there might be a spillover also to other policy areas? Now that you kind of, so you talked about the rescue package and this, uh, the common, uh, the European Union or the Commission going out into the markets and lending on behalf of the member states and also actually deciding whether their kind of uh, their packages or their recovery schemes are good enough to deserve. Uh, serve the funding basically. Um, so that is what you have referred to as an Hamiltonian moment amongst other things in your yeah 
but or some Maybe. people have referred to that it might be at least because it refers to this kind of big federalist step that was taking when when uh, Hamilton, uh, if I understand it correctly, kind of gathered the, the, the depth of all the states in the United States and it became kind of federal uh, depth. But um, so this is kind of a huge step. This is why it's also so important because you have this huge federalist step towards more EU powers in response to crisis. And can this then, if this works and it seems to be working, can it then spill over also to other policy areas such as migration, mm -hmm. such as health? I think, I think this, so I'm a neo-functionalist at heart, right? I'm mm -hmm. onto the failing forward model, but if you study health in Europe, it's hard not to be a neo-functionalist because all the all the hard-nosed bargaining between member states happens in the context of them realizing that they're stuck together. So if you go back to, for example, the foundational crisis of European food safety, which was mad cow disease, VCGD, and what happened there was simply that you integrated the market without integrating the, in this case, veterinary and food health consequences and got the disaster. And Horsegate, if you remember that one, where it turned out that six countries were involved in the scandal of Romanian horses showing up in Irish lasagna, proved again and caused more response that the regulation had not caught up. This is an equivalent. There, for a long time, European Communicable Disease Control, and there's essentially nobody who studied it until 2020, was based on cross-border small-scale things. So I remember one day discussing it in Luxembourg with the commission, and the only news item they had that day was a measles outbreak at a youth hockey tournament in Vienna. That's what the system was set up for. So this is completely different, right? This is going from children playing with sticks to, you know, total warfare. And I think that is what's going to stick is that member states are going to realize that they need to have better capacity to manage shared problems as well as to assist member states in controlling problems before they become shared. So that's why I'm optimistic, but I think the spillover is from an integrated economy to more integrated health services. Because between the fact that you strangle the southern European economies and make sun deprived northern Europeans angry, that you shut down essentially every supermarket in Europe if you don't let trucks cross borders, and that nobody can supply their healthcare system from their own resources. You put those three things together, it says you have to manage health emergencies together. And I know it sounds like a joke, but the epidemiological consequences of Germans wanting to go to Mallorca is absolutely important. <laughs> yes. Because I guess you've also been following these, uh, the negotiation now on the vaccine passport, which many, I know many we are discussing in Norway and many are uh, interested to hear more about. So uh, the last thing I heard was that it's coming, of course, the Commission has proposed it, and that means that it's been discussed already with most member states, and it's also been discussed with the European Parliament before it goes through the legislative procedure. And then the discussion is um, is on how you kind of make it, how you find the balance between justice and this very strong drive towards securing the free movement within the inner market and also, of course, the uh, European uh, vacation so mm -hmm. that people can travel. And uh, the last thing I heard was that it's likely that it will actually be functional in Europe in late June or July. Or so. So uh, what is your uh, insights on, <laughs> on the vaccine poor and support discussions? Have you been following that? In a sense, it's obvious. Like you can almost play out the obvious thing that's going to happen because there's demand for holidays, obviously. But there's demand for tourists because there is no plan to restructure the entire economy of from, Por from Portugal to Cyprus. They, they need tourism. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of reasons why there's no ability to make a short-term transition and why, frankly, nobody's ever going to locate high-end manufacturing in the Algarve. So that's the, a lot of the political pressure. 
And I think what it also has advantages, for example, from the perspective of the countries with a lot of vaccine hesitancy, it is one way to get people to get their vaccinations because if you have to drive to your holiday or because they won't let you on the plane or they won't let you in at the border because you're not vaccinated, that's incentive to get one dose of Johnson & Johnson. So I think it's going to happen. The problem I would anticipate is that the actual administration beyond what is necessary for air travel is going to be member states. And then you're going to get every member state peculiarity. Like I cannot imagine how long the Germans will take to figure out the privacy law dimensions. And you have other things. For example, a number of countries, the vaccine records are basically a piece of paper that anybody can forge. Hmm. So what do you do with somebody who has this thing that they could have printed out at home claiming to be vaccinated? Hmm. So there's a lot of technical problems coming and I think they're going to achieve, they're going to fail forward. They're going to achieve a European solution that works for the air travel industry. And we can all pretend it works well enough to reopen Spain and France and Italy. Mm. And on the member state level, you're going to have a gallery of strange things. Yeah, and they're also now proposing a new law on artificial intelligence and biometrics, which of course will have to be also taken into consideration. But are there also discussions on, on these vaccine passports and travel requirements between the European Union and the United States? This is one where I think the pattern is actually being set by the UK. And um, because the UK essentially said, we're going to ignore infection numbers, we're going to ignore case counts, we're going to look at the percent of your population that is vaccinated. This is a very British mind, by the way, because it completely ignores the fact that there's mobility within the European Union, right? So if one country is 70% vaccinated and one country is 50% vaccinated, the British think you can distinguish them which of course doesn't work if one country, if, if there's mobility between them, right? If there's mobility between Germany and Czechia. So what's likely I think is that a bunch of big countries are gonna settle on percent vaccinated as the key variable. And that's not epidemiologically stupid, but it's going to mean that that's a nice crude way to get air travel reopened this summer, which is what a lot of people want. Okay, so we're getting some more uh, questions from the audience uh, now. Uh, uh, just to follow up first, since we were talking about the UK and the US. Uh, in the media, the US and UK are often considered more successful uh, than the EU since the vaccination has progressed further. But this is partly because they have kept almost all the produced doses for themselves. And the US, we know, on the other hand, is a very more, much more uh, free trade oriented than actually exports more. It's probably harder for the EU to, to say that we are protecting exports uh, than for many other countries. Um, uh, so in terms of solidarity and long run, uh, long term vaccination, perhaps the EU was more successful anyway. Also coming back to how will we look at the EU and kind of five to ten years. I think they'll certainly say that. Um, I kind of want, okay, so the, on solidarity, absolutely. Um, I'm pretty sure Germany could have procured vaccines for itself. It wouldn't have worked as a public health strategy, but they would have been able to do it. I think that as ever, solidarity works best when there's an element of self-interest. So is Germany showing solidarity with Poland or is Germany showing a rational understanding that if Poland has got a raging pandemic, Germany is going to be affected? And I like, as a political scientist, I like it when there's a, a selfish reason to be solidaristic. That, that, that looks sustainable to me. The problem with global sharing. Partly the EU is committed to that. Normative power Europe does have some impact. Partly the EU is trapped because it has particularly strongly internationalized supply chains, right? So you can't have a fight with the UK because necessary materials for vaccines made in Europe pass through British companies. That said, I still think we need to say, you know, admit European policymakers made some mistakes. And I kind of said them. One is focusing on liability and price. 
and it's easy to see why they did that, but that was really stupid because the economic damage of a few weeks of lockdown is far larger than a badly priced vaccine. Secondly, focusing on liability, the liability of a vaccine on this scale is enormous. So that really scared the companies and slowed down the negotiation. What that meant is the companies, because they had no contracts signed, didn't start putting up production facilities in the European Union until relatively late. So that's why the factories are only coming online now, whereas the UK went to the opposite extreme and paid for people to be building factories in the UK on the condition that they would supply the UK in November. In November, the commission was still haggling about liability with Pfizer. So it is not hard to go back in history and replay one in which you say, we're going to give you a lot of money from some source and you can build vaccines for European production, plants for European production, you can build vaccine plants for global production. Instead, what happened is they signed contracts at the lowest price they could negotiate with no incentives to change the way the production facilities and supply chains were set up. And this is the result. You can say that it's solidaristic, but it's also bad planning, even if your goal is international solidarity. So good intent maybe, but you can tell that they've never bought pharmaceuticals in the European Commission. They buy printer paper. Okay, so a couple of questions also on the uh, the role of the Commission versus the member states, both in the EU and in health policies. Uh, so when it comes to uh, first uh, the kind of the balance between the Commission and the member states, um, do you, when it comes to uh, these new health policies and initiatives, they come in reaction to COVID-19. Do you see them mostly as demand driven uh, by the member states or are they mainly driven by uh, commission initiatives? So the commission kind of using this as a, an opportunity to drive integration. So this, this is this is a master's thesis for the taking, which is to deeply analyze March, April and May of 2020. Because on one hand, you can argue that the member states were in charge and the commission overstepped because their proposed health budget was far larger than what the member states approved. On the other hand, you can argue that the commission successfully used infringement proceedings to get countries to do things I think they would have done anyway. And then proposed a package of realistic things with no treaty change required that the member states would be guaranteed to sign up to. And that's great if you want to write a thesis about neo-functionalism and intergovernmentalism, but I feel like it's missing the forest for the trees because they faced an enormous crisis. They had an agreed upon understanding of what the European toolkit looks like. We know roughly what a treaty change looks like. We know what an agency looks like. We know what a research budget looks like. And they collectively realized the urgency of putting a lot of money into it. So. The commission, I don't think, had to show any special leadership because there was so much demand. But they did supply sort of the thing that was not that hard to think of, and they broadly got support. OK, <clears throat> and also uh, regarding the role of uh, the member states or national governments as such, maybe in dealing with pandemics. Um, and this is. Uh, also a question I asked, uh, have asked my students and heard other like who are the who are who is better at dealing with a crisis like a pandemic? Is it per, like is it naturally better to do this together in the European um, Union or are actually member states or national governments better able at dealing with with crisis like this with the pandemic? Because if you look at for example, in Norway, where we have a low death toll, we have not that many sick people. And so in that sense, uh, you could argue that actually smaller units or regions or states are better able at dealing with a pandemic than a bigger unit or polity like the, the EU. So coming back then to, to your argument about the EU actually doing quite a good job. Um, I think 
the European Union is doing quite a good job judge, judging by European integration. So if, if more European Union is your definition of success, then it's doing a very good job. Mm. I think there's there's a lot that goes into it, right? This is why I sort of had the Tolstoy quote that you had to get a lot of things right. You had to be careful on your borders 15 months ago, you know, in February 2020 at the latest. You have to have a strong public health system. You have to have good data. You have to have decisive politicians. So, for example, could the United Kingdom have done better? I can give you a fairly well established list of things Boris Johnson screwed up because he's Boris Johnson. But equally, many of the world's busiest international travel routes are in and out of Heathrow Airport. It's hard to imagine a disconnected United Kingdom. The whole country is built on a high level of mobility. So, I'm going to take a pass on who did better because, as Tolstoy said, all happy families are alike. But there's not that many of them because you need to do so many things right. You need to have the travel bans very early. You have to have test trace, isolate capacity. You have to have strong social policy measures to support people when you close down parts of the economy or individuals need to be supported in, in isolation. In terms of what unit of government is best, I can't speak to the Norwegian situation except to envy you, but um, the problem tends to be that bigger states are ultimately crucial, right? So what both the United States and the European Union have discovered is that 10 million people isn't that big for certain purposes. It's not big enough to manage the crisis within a larger economy specifically, right? Sweden, well, no, Sweden's mismanagement is a different problem, right? Austria is not big enough to make policies that will save Austria. Just like Michigan, same population is not big enough to make policies that will save Michigan. We were in hell because Donald Trump was running the federal government. Austria could do all sorts of things, but without strong European policies, on vaccines and border controls, they were going to suffer whatever happened in Northern Italy. Mm. Public health is necessarily local, right? The policy tools are local. If you can have a shutdown, the restaurant inspectors and the police are local. The primary care is local. The ability to communicate the right message about behavior is local. But equally, the management of a large and interconnected economy is best done at a very big level. And border control is obviously the business of states. That's what I would say. And as for vaccines, the bigger you are, the easier it is to get the attention of a pharmaceutical company. There's no chance Malta would have any chance of buying anything under normal rules of pharmaceutical industry behavior. They just wouldn't take the call. Malta's not big enough. Mm -hmm. There's American hospital systems with larger budgets than the Maltese government. They'll get an answer. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, coming back or continuing this kind of uh, theme of uh, the EU's ability to deal with this crisis, um, uh, it has not led the EU to break down as we uh, we have been arguing and the EU has even moved forward with more integration and done quite a lot in this uh, field already, especially with uh, in the economic uh, field, per, uh, with the rescue package, etc. Uh, but it seems it failed with a successful vaccine strategy, or at least that's how it looks at the moment. It might change, of course. And is there something, if we want to learn something more broadly about the EU from this, is there something kind of about the way that the EU functions that can explain this, that it's more difficult for the EU to respond effectively, rapidly to these kinds of crisis when you actually need to act uh, rapidly. So is there something that, so that if we are faced with this type of crisis another time, will the EU also then kind of struggle to, to react quickly because it's something about the way that this animal works <laughs> in a sense? I think, and this is partly based on, you know, 34 countries. Mm -hmm. What's amazing is how, how true to themselves countries stay. And you even see it within the pandemic that as far as I can tell, nobody in France or Britain has learned anything. They keep on doing exactly the same things at three month intervals. Mm. 
So the striking thing is how the political systems responded with really what they had in themselves. And you can even argue that the Swedish response was quite predictable from people who know Sweden better than I do would say, well, of course they would do something like that. Of course the French would do what they did. So I think in a sense, this was a great opportunity to observe a lot of political systems, including EU. And what we found is that they behaved like you would expect. The Czechs turned out to have a highly personalized idiosyncratic way of behaving. So a businessman with an Excel spreadsheet projecting horrible things got to the prime minister, persuaded him, and they had the toughest lockdown in Europe. Then a dentist with a spreadsheet saying they should reopen got to the prime minister. They opened everything and then they were rewarded with the worst surge in Europe. Nobody who studies Czechia is surprised. Nobody who studies Spain is surprised that they've had an enormous amount of bickering between nationalist parties and the central state or that it's incredibly partisan or that they just are not equipped to evaluate what are otherwise very professional public health bureaucracies. I could go on, you know. Nobody should be surprised that the first instinct of Dutch policymakers was herd immunity. Nobody should be surprised that Germany turns out to have been held together by the CDU in large part, despite all the formal behaviors designed otherwise. Nobody should have been surprised that Denmark actually had a really good pandemic. Um, and again, nobody should be surprised that the EU came together in a way that's going to look good from a couple of years out, but also came together in a way that was angering and dispiriting and slow and had misplaced priorities, because that's exactly what you'd expect from what is fundamentally a European executive that works in the service of 27 very different countries. So not only do you have to do something 27 very different countries want, you also need to do it with a bureaucracy that has evolved to service that kind of political unit. And that is, for example, how you get a focus on price, which is completely myopic in the context of the economic damage of the pandemic, but which is also completely explicable in terms of what the European Commission has been trained to do by 27 member states that don't want to be blamed for scandals. You're muted, uh, Mariana, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so unless e health policy becomes an EU issue, nothing will really change. That's what you're saying. So there has to be kind of some big steps taken at the EU level for this to change the next time. I think public health policy is now officially an EU policy and it's going to stay that way because Nobody's going to be able, nobody is going to forget what member state governments learned viscerally in spring of 2020, which is that it's too late. You cannot disconnect these economies. Mm. You know, there is no way to move food around Europe or produce manufactured goods. And therefore, just like it's now accepted that the European Union has strong food law regulation, I think there's going to be an acceptance that it's going to have strong communicable disease. It's less likely that the EU is going to have a health care policy, doctors and nurses and hospitals, simply because that puts the focus on the thing that you must never discuss in European politics, which is the economic disparities between member states. Mm. Because the scale of the difference between the Bulgarian and the Luxembourgish or German economies, they're so different that you're never going to find Germans who actually want to equalize their income with Bulgaria. They had enough with German unification. They don't want to do Eastern Europe. So you're not going to see a health care policy, but I think we have a public health policy because a shared public health policy solves neo-functionalism here, solves the problems that you get once you're completely economically integrated. Uh, another question, uh, what do the participants think about EU instruments such as the temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency, sure, and the recovery and resilience facility, which have been introduced as temporary instruments? Do you think they could lead to the introduction of more permanent 
instruments? That's the question about the Hamiltonian moment, right? So for those of you who are not political economy nerds, because I can say from experience that even if you like American history, the phrase Hamiltonian moment was new to me a year ago. And it's when the federal government assumed the debt of the states for the war. It was a temporary measure, right? We had a particular event, the Revolutionary War. It led to a particular debt load that was temporarily assumed. What mattered was the precedent. What mattered was the learning. The precedent that the federal government could take on debt, essentially finance the states, and the learning that this actually had benefits, that you got a better functioning federation when you pooled some of your risks at the biggest level. This is basic economics of fiscal federalism. You want to pool risks at the biggest level possible. That's why reinsurance companies are enormous. So the Hamiltonian moment was personalized because a lot of people have seen the musical. But what it really meant is when the US had the discovery that you can have a temporary shared fiscal structure, which turns out to be such a good idea that you have a permanent one. I would say it would be incredibly risky of them not to make something like this permanent because there's not a single viable federation in the world that doesn't equalize and reinsure between its different component units. And the EU is, this bothers me less than the rule of law, but the EU has got an economic death spiral going on because everything about its current economic structure makes some countries richer and some countries poorer and fooling around with national budgets does not solve the internal disparities, right? There's no way out for Southern and Eastern Europe. So the scenario that Europe is looking at is Italy after reunification when you had a rigid liberal framework that made the North richer and the South poorer. They bought off the South with capital investment, think structural funds, and they were awarded with corruption and outmigration. And a continental mezzo giorno going from Portugal to Estonia is the risk. Mm. And the way around that is not to imitate 19th century Italy, it's to imitate every other federation in the world and accept that you need to pool risks at a high level. The alternative is not to be federated. Ask the British. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And also, uh, maybe we could also come back a bit to this kind of the international role of the EU and all of this. Uh, because even if you start from a um, self-interested perspective, whether you take the kind of normative power Europe or you take the self-interested perspe uh, EU perspective, um, most uh, scholars will tell us that it makes sense to vaccinate the entire world more or less and we also have uh, institutions to deal with this in the world health organization we have the world trade organization discussing uh, whether or not um, uh, you should be able to produce vaccines uh, in other facilities than the ones that are owned by the pharmaceutical companies etc etc the uh, and uh, and we have the COVAX uh, system. So, uh, do you what? How do you see the EU's role in this? Is the EU really is it able to take? It's a big question. But so far, if you have been studying this, and I think you have, uh, is the EU actually taking on a big role in this uh, work? And is it doing a good job? Is it kind of playing the normative power Europe card, or is it just looking at its own population here? It's looking at its own population. It doesn't have the luxury of being quite as ethnocentric as the British or the Americans because it has a more integrated production chain with other countries because of decisions made in late 2020. But I think the pressure is building. COVAX is completely underfunded, right? If we if countries that rely on COVAX, which include European neighbors, Bosnia, Herzegovina, you know, major sources of migrant labor, um, they're not going to have an adequate vaccine cover supply of vaccines until 2022 at the earliest. And realistically, COVAX might never achieve its goal. So we're breeding variants in all sorts of different countries around the world. We are suffering tremendous economic damage. It's an ethical nightmare. And soon the EU is going to catch up with the United States in having about three doses of vaccine for everybody who wants one. Mm -hmm. So the real question is, do you go for a systemic solution, the TRIPS waiver on patents in which you allow Pfizer 
but a number of other companies. There's a lot of patents here in which you suspend those patents so that they uh, patent protections so that middle income countries can figure out how to make good vaccines, right? Because COVAX is basically AstraZeneca. If AstraZeneca turns out to not have to have to not treat certain variants well and you need Pfizer, well, COVAX is not that helpful to you, right? We have to have more vaccines in the portfolio. And the vaccines are wonderful, right? We have a lovely range of great vaccines, but you can't just treat with one if you have a variety. That's bad public health practice. So we have an inadequate supply of AstraZeneca. The TRIPS waiver will allow middle income country production of a full range of vaccines, which is the good systemic solution. And we'll learn just how much more cheaply the Malaysians or the Filipinos or the South Africans can make vaccines. The alternative is you let off just enough pressure in the way the Chinese and the Russians are already doing, which is that you export the vaccine doses that you don't need to take credit, put a big flag on the side and talk about mm. your, your world leading power, right? So that's what the U.S. is already starting to do because we have a ridiculous amount of AstraZeneca sitting in a warehouse in Ohio and we're giving it to Mexico. Mm. And that's going to be a tool of power, just like the Russian and Chinese vaccines are a tool of power. And pretty soon the EU is going to start to bump up against vaccine hesitancy. There's going to be a lot of unused vaccines in places like Poland and Czechia and France. And it will be very tempting for the EU or France to start buying diplomatic power with some sh showy donations. You already see it in the Western Balkans where Bosnia-Herzegovina's vaccine supply has been given to them by Russia, Turkey, and Austria, which sounds like everything in the geopolitical history of the Western Balkans. Gosh, the Austrians, the Russians, and the Turks are having an argument in Bosnia. Everything old is new again. Yeah, that's... Uh... I guess you have, you mentioned that, I guess you would could say that there are kind of three approaches. It's the uh, vaccine diplomacy, the soft power kind of way of using vaccines to get influence, which we might be seeing China and Russia do to a large extent, I guess. Then you have the humanitarian approach, sharing on a humanitarian basis, and then uh, the multilateral cooperation approach. Uh, and um, the EU would tend to be the main actor supporting this multilateral approach together with the United States. But do you see uh, that, do you see a tendency to such a cooperation within, for example, the World Health Organization and also World Trade Organization now also hopefully involving China and Russia at some, some point, just to end with a rather big uh, question. I think the Chinese and the Russians have no intention of being constructive. Um, in the same, a lot of countries have, but I think what you're, I think the likeliest good outcome is you, those were beautiful phrases that you used. I'm trying to remember them. I think if multilateral cooperation is essentially a TRIPS waiver, reducing the patent protections, I think that has a strong chance of succeeding. It would be of the vaccine producing countries, it would be most in Europe's interest because Europe does have the most internationally integrated supply chain, right? So it solves the problem with India in a sense. Because right now the Indians understandably think they have a bigger problem than Europe and they're backing off on supplies of necessary things to Europe. So they're going to start to gum up European supply chains. So I think Europe has a moral as well as a practical incentive to support multilateral cooperation. What worries me is that it's going to be vaccine diplomacy that you ride out the next few months and then France starts handing out vaccines in the Sahel and Hungary starts handing out vaccines in Belarus or something like the Serbs are already doing. And it lets off the international pressure. It confuses the issue. Everybody gets to, there was one lovely picture from I think Kenya where the Chinese sent one pallet of vaccines, which is maybe 5,000 doses. And they dragged the entire government out to the airport to watch the airplane arrive. That's great for Chinese diplomacy, but it's a failure as public health. And mm. I think the temptation will be to do lots of that. And Macron can deliver vaccines across the Francophonie. And, you know, Hungary can try to build soft power in the Balkans or whatever Hungary wants to do. And I'm worried that will take off the pressure for a proper multilateral solution. And if we don't get a proper global vaccination based solution, we are going to be stuck with this forever.
Yes. Health policy, security policy, <laughs> and international politics, and uh, EU integration. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, been a pleasure. I really learned a lot. It's uh, super interesting, and I very much look forward to reading your uh, news book more in depth. Uh, and the new, uh, also the third edition of uh, the everything you need to know about the EU. Yeah, that's when I have actually read. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I uh, you can find uh, a link to both of these books then on uh, the web page for this uh, seminar, and uh, also remember to sign up for Nipis newsletter so you get. Uh, news on all the other uh, interesting seminars and events that are going on and thank you all for attending and for interesting questions thank you thank you bye